Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. I am Ramon Mejia. I'm here to bring you the latest RPG news, reviews, and of course, author interviews. Uh, this week I have seven new Lit RPG titles and reviews just for you folks at home. Uh, this is going to include Threadbare Volume 2, so, so You Want to Be a Hero. Cute title, cute story. Uh, also up for review is going to be The Cost of Survival, a Lit RPG Apocalypse. This is the third book in the uh, System Apocalypse series. Uh, also is going to be the Greystone Chronicles Book 3, Darkness Falls. After that, it'll be Permadeath Online. Uh, then it will be Return to Dungeon, uh, a Monster MC Lit RPG, a uh, Cobalt Quest Book 1. Uh, then it is going to be A Fistful of Sand, a Book of Corellia, and last is going to be Inside Out. Uh, we have all those titles reviewed for you. But of course, we begin our show, though, with Lit RPG News. And in Little RPG news, again, uh, kind of a light Little RPG news week, uh, but we do have some great um, stuff from Travis Bagwell, the author of the Awaken Online series, has released the 3D images of a figurine that he might be selling on his page soon. Um, he actually has quite a few items um, for purchase on his website if you want to go check it out. Um, but this is definitely one of the cooler things that I've seen, uh, one of the Little Beach authors kind of put together on their own time. Uh, he has a, has a 3D modeler make a... Uh, I want to say a figurine scene of Jason, the necromancer, uh, raising the undead, and it looks so awesome. Um, if you're looking at the video version podcast, you can see what I'm seeing. But if you're listening to this just as an audio podcast, um, it's Jason. His hands are out. He's dressed in his necromancer robe. There's a thorn tree, you know, creepily behind him, and like zombies are coming out of a graveyard. And in front of him, of course, is the most infamous black cat. So very cool scene. I definitely recommend you go checking it out. He actually has a 3D. Um, model on his Facebook page, like actually the the video of it, like rotating in 3D, so you can see it from all the different angles, um, and it is super super cool. So if I can't wait till um, it is actually finished, I might actually pick one up. Um, I'm a big fan of, of Awake Online, and of course uh, Travis Bagwell and his work. So um, really cool stuff. Okay, now that's kind of it for Little Bridge News. Uh, stories that are out now that I have not reviewed. Um, may review in the future, but these are out as of today. Um, Lost Horizon Omnibus Edition. This is going to be for the two books in the series, Beta and Live. I mean, this is not new um, content. It's just the author uh, putting them together um, for your convenience. It's actually a little bit cheaper than buying them separately. And also, there it's on Kindle Unlimited, so you can actually read the entire, you know, good, I don't know, 800 words uh, to 1,000, I believe, um, for that series. Um, and it's there. The author was very upfront about it when he posted about it uh, on Facebook and various groups saying, this is not new content. This is just an omnibus because readers have asked for it. And if you're new to the series, this is definitely a, a good one. It's about older gamers near retirement or at the end of their life and how they choose to spend their last days um, in a game, in a VR MMO game. So very... Well, the end is kind of sad, but it's it's so interesting. Uh, also out now is Bushido Online, Friends and Foes. Uh, this is the second book in that particular series. Uh, and uh, also out is the Omega Dream. I, I don't know much about it. It popped up today. Um, look through it just to make sure it was Liberty. I saw little indicators that it is. So here it is. It does show up on like a Liberty search on Amazon. So uh, the Omega Dream. Um, new audiobooks that are out for Little BG. We have a couple out. The New Horizons, I'm really a book four by Michael Chatfield. Um, friend of this podcast, done some author interviews with a guy. Very friendly, good, good guy. Um, audiobooks are always really done well and really rabid fan base um, for his work. So go grab that if you have not yet. Uh, also out as an audiobook is The War Eternius, The Beginnings by Charles Dean. Um, this one is actually going to be narrated by Jeff Hayes, both guys whom I've interviewed um, in the past or have spoken to, I should say. Um, War of Eternius, nice story as well. Um, go get go get samples on Audible. Go check them out. Go go catch them. They're entertaining. Uh, the Both books have gotten good reviews from, from me as far as the ebooks go. Okay, um, upcoming Little BG. These are just stories that I know about that's coming out from Amazon or things that the authors have told me and they're, you know, the publication dates. Um, there are some shifts in this particular schedule. Nothing really new, though. Um, so skip ahead if you wish to. Um, Arthur Stone's 
uh, ne- next letter to be destroyed that's being um, translated and published in English is going to be out on February the 7th called Respawn Lives 1 through 5. Um, you might know him better from the Weirdest Noob series, I believe. Um, or is it? Yeah, Weirdest Noob series, I, I believe. Uh, Adam Drake's Kingdom Level 4 will be out on February the 28th. On February the 20th as well, it'll be Dragon Seed, a lit RPG writer adventure. There you go. Uh, also out on the 20th is going to be Avatar's Rising Silos. Now that shifted from a late March to an early February, or sorry, a late February release date. So beware of that. Uh, the Way of the Shaman Clans Wars, uh, the last book in the Way of the Shaman series, is still scheduled for sometime in February. We haven't gotten a more specific release date, but it has been confirmed by both uh, Magic Jump Books and the author that this is still on schedule for February release. So if you're wondering. Um, Bastille Mahingo's other work, um, the Dark Paladin series, the third book in that series, will be out on March the 6th. Uh, it is currently in for pre-order. Um, the second book in the Permadeath Online series will be out on March the 15th. Uh, so we'll review the first book in this, in this particular podcast, and the next one will be out in March on the 15th. Um, and last but not least, To Kill the Rain, the fourth book in the Patera Online series, will be out on March the 16th. So there we go, folks. That's everything you know about for the next couple months. On to new releases and reviews. And any releases and reviews we're going to begin with Threadbare, Volume 2, So You Want to Be a Hero. So it's spelled S-E-W. Very cute. Uh, the cover art is always very engaging as well. So this is probably a really big draw uh, for people. It's cute and adorable, and the cover art reflects that as well. Uh, this one is 345 pages, $4.99. Not available on Kindle Unlimited, though. Um, however, I highly recommend it. If, you, if you've not read if you're into, like, um, monster class or, like, monster point of view stuff, this is a really good series that also incorporates some very interesting um, and cute stuff about golems and teddy bear golems and adorable stuff. Um, book one in the series got a 7 out of 10 for me. Um, mostly because the last bit of it shifted away from the main character, in my opinion, um, Threadbare, and kind of made him a secondary character in like his, his owner's story, um, and that drew a little bit away from me. Still a good story, though. Uh, book two is actually better, uh, and that's pretty rare in my experience that the second book is actually better than the first in many ways. Uh, I'll read you the author's description. Um, Threadbare has not had a very good time of it recently. His little girl has been taken from him, and he must travel the kingdom, finding allies old and new, living and dead to help him rescue Celia. Fortunately, he's got a new voice now, and access to all those fun skills he couldn't use before. He may only be a very small teddy bear, but he's got the persistence to plow through dungeons and rascally raccoon monsters, the wilds to turn a a a town full of undead on its ear, and the sanding to survive an encounter with a mediocre old one. However, Threadbear's little girl is growing up, and her own path is hard and brutal. Will she even have a use for her old teddy bear when they meet again? Will they both survive the encounter? And the author warns the uh, novel contains profanity, violence, and a creepy villain who likes tentacles way too much. Um, little pun there. Humor. Okay, um, my general opinion is that this is a better book than book one, and I like book one. Um, Threader is back, and he's made some new friends. Everything you love about book one has returned, and there's just more of it. Uh, there's loads of action, adventure, crafting, leveling, skill gains, and it's all told from the point of view of a cuddly teddy bear that's come to life as a golem. Um, the things that are different about book two that shifted from book one, um, the story is set five years uh, into the future um, from book one, so book one ends and five years jump. Um, and it's sort of necessary for the story to reset a little bit. It gives the main character, Threadbear, the needed space to grow and for it to be to still have that sense of discovery. Um, and I think it's a good choice. It works for the story. Um, also, Threadbear can talk now. In book one, that was probably one of the issues of that. All the things that the main character was seeing were just from his own head, and he couldn't express or communicate really well with the outside real. That changes here. And I think that allows a lot of uh, good storytelling opportunity. Now, then, of course, he can engage in conversations with other people. He actually becomes a fuller character. Um, there are also more cast members. If you look at the cover, you can see a bunch of golems and other characters and casts. Um, and they help fill out the golem um, stuffed bear story a little bit. Because if it's just the main character, there's only so much he can do and interact with. Um, with a larger cast on the on, on like the Threadbare side, um, there's more interaction, there's more jokes, there's more bantering uh, available. And that's uh, also a good draw here. 
Um, however, the biggest improvement in the story, uh, for me at least, is that the story stays with Threadbearer for most of it. Uh, there are some sections where it shifts to other people's point of views, um, but those sections are just them. And when it's on Threadbearer, it is actually about Threadbearer and his story. And I think that's the draw for, for this particular series. It's, I mean, his humans uh, and the other people are, are interesting in their own respect, but the big the big star is the cuddly teddy bear named Threadbow, and it, and the story stays on that more. And I think that's a that's a great decision from the author, uh, because of course he's he's the star and he's the one that is the most interesting to me at least. Um, I had a great time reading the story, and I just about read the whole thing in one sitting, so I can't recommend this one enough. Uh, score of eight out of ten. That's Threadbear Volume Two. So you want to be a hero? Uh, super adorable. I mean, it gets a little dark for some people, but it's, 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 it's interesting and it's, you know, it's fun. Um, in addition for me. So there you go. Okay. On to the apocalypse, uh, the system apocalypse book three, the cost of survival written by Tao Wong. Uh, and I think it's still the author's last name, Andrew Siepel from, um, Threadbare. So I don't want to forget author's titles. Uh, so I guess now we're on to cost of survival by Tao Wong. Uh, my opinion, it's uh, 286 pages. It's $4.09 and it's available on Kindle Unlimited. So always a plus for me. Um, the author's description. The Onvilic spores have been defeated. The dungeon tamed, but at great cost. John and his friends are reeling from the losses, but the countdown to full integration to the system continues. Threatened by system integrated races and new, more powerful monsters, John will need to get creative if he and the city are to survive. The cost of survival is, um, sorry, that's extra stuff, but it being letter BG. Um, book three of this particular arc, a series, uh, this is the final episode in this particular arc. That's not the end of the series per, per se, but the author has said in the back of this particular book, okay, he's going to take a little break. Um, that this is, this kind of ends a really good point for the story. It's going to continue on, um, but it, it's, it's, it's a pretty good ending. Um, there's a lot of action, adventure, RPG power-ups, um, and it was Generally interesting to see how John and his friends dealt with and protected Whitehall from monstrous swarms, and in this particular novel, especially politics. Um, that's right. This novel goes into a little more of the politics of like the larger system and all the alien species involved in it. Um, one of small note annoyance um, with the novel would kind of be for me at least the transitions between the scenes um and this is just maybe nobody else has noticed but this but this kind of bothered me and that one paragraph the main character would be in town and the next city would be hundreds of miles away and there was no real transition between those places between those paragraphs like there was no chapter break or no like um stars indicating like there is a difference uh there is a shift in scenes it was just like oh we're walking along we're gonna go to this place and the next paragraph we're here and we you know and and it continued on without any kind of transition like oh there's there's a scene shift here and that that it happens multiple times in the story that's kind of the only thing that bu bugged me a little bit because it, it 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 doesn't occur in the other books which seemed weird how about other than that um had an overall a good time reading it and I can't wait to see what else happens. But this is, like I said, a lot of this is just more of the same. It's a very slice life story. Uh, this one had a little bit more of an arc in that there was a there was a goal for the team to go through. Um, so some people might like this more than others. But for the most part, it's it's more of the stuff you've probably enjoyed if, you, if you're enjoying this particular series. So gets a score of 7 out of 10 for me. The Cost of Survival. A little bit of Apocalypse System Apocalypse Book 3 with the score of 7 out of 10. Okay. On to another series, um, The Greystone Chronicles, book three, Darkness Falls, um, written by Dave Woolmorth. Okay, uh, this one is 413 pages, $3.99, super awesome price point, by the way, um, available on Kindle Unlimited. I'll read you the author's description. Alexander and the Greystone Guild are expanding their territory, building up the keep, conquering new lands, and recruiting citizens of all races. And when they've prepared enough, they plan on taking the fight to the minions of the Dark One in their own strongholds. New friends are discovered and alliances are made. Tragedy befalls one of the group, and the Dark One's identity is finally discovered. And a new, yet at the same time ancient enemy, makes itself known, threatening to change the face of Io forever. Okay, uh, and all that's totally true. Um, it also kind of spoils several of the bigger plot points. Um, but, hey, whatever. Um, honestly, um, the beginning of this novel kind of made me 
giggle a little bit, uh, laugh. The forward on it, it's a really nice summary of the last book. But it, whenever I read these at the beginning, I always feel like this should be like titled "Last Time on the Greystone Chronicles." Like this is a like a television series, like an episodic series. Um, and a lot of and, and this one in particular almost really does feel like that. Um, book three in the series picks up right off where book two left us dangling, um, facing an unexpected army of demons and a lich, and the situation is quickly resolved, and the story gets back down to town building, recruiting, and social stuff. And that's kind of the tone of this particular novel. Um, this series in particular feels very um, episodic, like it's almost a television show or like a BBC show, or like it, it plans to be six or seven you know episodes long, and each one has like a good chunk of stuff. But you can also tell that there are um, threads that plan to be um, filled later on in the series. Um, there's lots of action in the story, but overall. This really, this one in particular, feels very daily adventure or slice of life. Um, there are fewer epic battles than there are in other books. In the other books in the series, I should say, there's more city building, crafting, and town management stuff. And those are the big, big parts of this particular um, novel in particular. Uh, so if you're a fan of that stuff like I am, great. You have a good time with it. There's still, again, um, story development, advancement. Uh, of characters and advancement of the rural storyline where that whole thing is complicated with like the terrorist bombs or whatever. Um, so all that, all that does get advancement. But again, the big focus is on that city building um, city management aspect stuff here. Um, one of the things I think could have been done, I guess better was probably like the big reveal of like who the dark one is. The, it's not spoilery. The author says it in the, uh, in the, in the novel description. So this is nothing spoilery that I'm saying. Um, it's just that the big reveal, I, I guess I expected it to be bigger, especially considering like, he's been the main villain for, for books one, two, and three. And then finally in book three, it's like, Oh, that's it. I'm like, Oh, that's, I mean, it, 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 maybe it's just a red herring. Uh, it, it, it made, be uh, a completely different dark one later on. I don't know. Uh, but I was a little disappointed. And especially considering it was like such a s relatively small portion of the story, I would have thought that would have been like the big epic thing at the end of like the first, you know, the third book in the series. It's, it is what it is. But there's also very little foreshadowing in my opinion, at least about who the dark one turns out to be. Like there are like a couple hints, I guess, um, but not a ton of it. So it also felt a bit sudden as to the reveal being there. And I don't know if the author has a particular plan in mind for that particular story, or he just felt like he had to finish it off in book three. Um, but it is what it is. Um, now, the, uh, another big thing about the story is that the cast of characters is becoming really, really long. Um, this also happened in the Emma Rilly series, and what the author did there was he put a cast of characters at the very end of the story, so you could be reminded, if you don't remember oh, who this particular person is, um, you could look at the glossary in the back to be reminded who they are, because that, that that novel, that series, also has a ton of characters, as this one is. Like, there's the core group of characters who would have ventured together, the players, uh, but then there's, like, just every, every, every book, there's some more and more people being introduced with, like, names, and so I assume they're going to be important if you're being, if you're naming them at some point, um, including other players, other NPCs, and the, the cast is getting so big that it, it's hard for me to remember um, who everybody is sometimes, and, you know, that's, it is what it is, so a nice scholarship at the end probably will help people like me, who just don't remember who everybody is, kind of refresh their, main, you know, their minds if they need them. Uh, but of course, uh, your favorite characters are still there, and you get to spend plenty of time with them. Fibble is always a, a big uh, fan favorite for me, at least. Super adorable goblin. And this time, I'm happy to see that he gets the opportunity to grow um, RPG-wise. Um, so it's fun to see that as well. Um, I still have the same kind of complaints about um, the way death is treated in the series. And again, this is something I've said in books one and two and now three. So at least the author is consistent about how he treats death and the character's point of view. It's just, it's still here. And it's, it, it just bugs my mind for us because it feels a little inconsistent as far as like um, views of how death is treated. The main character in his group always gets super upset and angry anytime one of them, them die. Um, even though they know that, you know, their, their player friends are going to resurrect. Okay. Um, and this is explained within the story as like, oh, they're immersed. They have this immersion rig, so it feels more real and their emotional responses are knee-jerk. Um, so so I'm, I'm really, I'm okay with that, to be honest. Um, that makes total sense. However, the inconsistency enters in when, if they feel like their death is real, 
why do they not have a problem with murdering other players? Um, it, it, it's just, it's inconsistent. Like at one point in the story, like the main characters go in and they like cut some throats of like other players who were just sleeping and not minding their business, which is murder. Uh, and they, you know, kill them when they're having sex or doing other things, um, uh, because they're infiltrating the race. Um, and, but they have no qualms about that whatsoever. Um, and I'm like, that inconsistency just, I don't know, just nags my brain for it. like, you you get super upset and angry when your friends die, but you have no problem with murdering murdering total strangers or you know sometimes NPCs if they need to be. Uh, and I'm like, and they haven't necessarily done anything bad to you. Like you initiated battle, so I'm like that just seems like a weird, it's like a slight inconsistency about the view of death. And I'm like, I like I say, I'll give the author props because he's he's been consistent about it the entire series. Just that. It's always bothered me. So small complaint that continues to be on the story. Um, overall, though, an enjoyable story. Like though, if I if that's the thing that bothers me, like this is this is this is a good story. Um, so I like the kingdom building stuff. Not everybody's gonna like the slice of life aspect of this particular story, um, but it is what it is. The adventure, the characters go into adventures. They do kingdom building. They do crafting stuff. Um, they get into a couple of fights. Um, and you know, overall, though, it's mostly about like the slice of left kingdom and stuff. So uh, I enjoyed it though. It gets a score of seven out of 10 for me. Um, that's the Grayson Chronicles book three, Darkness Falls uh, with the score of seven out of 10. So there you go. Okay. On to Permadeath Online, a little bit of adventure book one written by, um, I want to say that's DJ or it might be AJ uh, Chudrawi. You know, those, those curvy letters, letter, letters kind of mess me up. I can't tell. Uh, but it's Primitive Online Book 1. So I apologize to the author if I'm messing your name up entirely. I apologize. Okay, this one is 151 pages. $2.99 available on Kindle Unlimited. So, you know, go for free to go try it out if you have Kindle Unlimited. It's always a great program. I'll read you the author's description. Uh, Rohan is an NPC in the real world. Stuck at a job he despises, his only escape is the fantasy paperbacks that he shares his bed at that share his bed at night. Once a gaming addict, Rohan renounces gaming ten years back thanks to a painful incident in his life. When Privithi Online, a VR MMORPG unlike any other, is unleashed, Rohan does his best to avoid it. That he cannot afford the game helps as well. But when a friend brings an opportunity to play Privithi Online for free, Rohan can resist no more. He lets his resolution slip. However, something fishy is going on in the world of Privithi, and strange notifications asking him to maintain a distance from hooded people are only deep in the mystery. Soon, Rohan's life in the game is turned upside down as he uncovers a plot that can have deadly consequences to the world of Privithi and the real world as well. That's the author's description. And um, for the most part... That is all true in the story. Um, it uh, this novel could have been good. I mean, it, uh, for the, um, I, 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 I guess I'm a little flushed because one, there are some great parts of the story. Like the, the, some some of the cultural opportunities here are, are had so much potential. Um, it's just that they're not really developed well. Um, the writing also is reflective of a non-Native American speaking patterns, um, which makes sense considering the story takes place in India. Um, but the shift in vernacular uh, and phrasing might bother some people because it is very much reflective of, uh, of a different way of speaking English. Um, and I refer to specifically as American because um, there are just some shifts there. Um, a couple of examples. My eyes had been losing it. Um, another one is, don't you ever want to leave this blasted job? And the man also told me, and if you've ever seen um, any Bollywood movies, this phrasing it might seem familiar. It's very much of um, people in India speaking English. Like they're just anytime you have different cultures, different social um, countries, um, there's always going to be like different patterns of speaking languages. Even if even you're speaking the same language, and so this is definitely reflective of that. But it's it, I know it's going to bother some people. Um, because it, it, it pops out of my mind. It's like, oh, that's that's different. Uh, and some people don't like that differences. Other people don't care. For me, I, I liked it personally. I honestly thought it gave the novel a, a nice cultural flair and a nice uh, opportunity to see a new cultural perspective in the novel. Um, and, it, and the story honestly gets full credit for trying to use Indian mythology in the story. Um, 
but unfortunately it's it's a minor part of the story and the game stuff in particular uh, but still it, it it does try to be different um there is very little world building in the game um and the description in the game world honestly felt kind of flat i wish there would have been more indian mythology more more world building that made me feel made me feel like the game world was as fleshed out and as real as the real world was um and as a consequence, I like the real world story better. And that's never a good sign when, you're, when your story is supposed to be mostly about um, an in-game MMO story. Um, the part that I really liked, let's see, uh, I actually probably see. The part that really was interesting was that it gave me a glimpse into culture that I'm not used to reading about. So I really actually like the Indian cultural aspect of it. I just wish there was more of it. Um, unfortunately, the real world part of it is only 15%, but it's honestly my favorite part of the story because it, like I said, give, gave me personally a glimpse into like, oh, this is a different world. This is a different culture. And it, but it, at the same time, it feels real. It's not fantasy. It's not sci-fi. It just is. It's a different way of looking at the world, the different cultural aspects between uh, men and women and the way the society is structured. And I, it felt very interesting to me, I guess. Um, I, I like learning about different cultures. And I think this was a missed opportunity because it is such a small part of it. And it d really doesn't, it doesn't flow into the game world portion of it. The game world portion of it feels more traditional MMO, more traditional fantasy in a lot of respects, even though there are like um, Indian cultural aspects to it, some of the um, playable races and the monster of very much based on like Indian mythology of like demons, uh, like a particular type of demon called, um, I shortened in my review to Tarak. Um, I think it's Rakshasha. Don't get mad if I say it wrong. Um, and But that's kind of the extent of it, unfortunately. Uh, once the main character enters the game world, he honestly becomes less interesting. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, the game mechanics also in the game aren't particularly special. Um, and overall, they're kind of minimal. Um, the... Most of the story is a slice of life. Sorry, in the game stuff. The, most of the game stuff is a slice of life story where the main character wanders from fight to fight against the Rack, which is a, I can, I'm not going to say the funny name, um, a warrior demon race. Uh, and they almost appear to be like the only monsters to fight in the game, which uh, again, kind of makes combat um, a little more repetitive because again, it's the same kind of monster every single time, even though there are some slight variations of like, oh, kinds of this monster, like shaman, warrior, lower class, whatever it is. Um, it's still the same monster. Um, and so I would have loved to see more variety in the types of creatures that the main character fought, but that didn't happen here. Um, even when the introduction of permadeath in the novel is introduced, it doesn't really do anything because it doesn't apply to the main character. It doesn't apply to him personally. There's no th real threat to him uh, as a person. And so that doesn't raise the stakes of the story necessarily, which is unfortunate because permadeath should be uh, as a threat, um, kind of the ultimate stake. Um, but it, it kind of, to me, it fell a little flatter because it only applies to people who have been digitized permanently. So like in the story, it's just explained that um, when it came out, people became digitized citizens, like they uploaded their minds um, to the game permanently because they were disabled or they're super sick or poor or whatever. Um, and so they live in this world permanently. And when permadeath is introduced, at uh, weirdly enough, at the behest of the government, um, it only applies to them. So like regular players who just jump in a pod and play for a couple hours it doesn't apply. Um, so it's, it is what it is. Um, there's also a cliffhanger at the end that has no setup or no foreshadowing. And honestly, it doesn't make sense. I could, it really comes out of left field. Um, still it's, I don't want you to think this is a necessarily a bad story. Um, the action adventure stuff is, is decent. Um, there are some, there is some character development. But there's not a lot, unfortunately, like I had a really hard time empathizing with the main character and wanting him or his world to do well. Um, it just wasn't there unfortunately for me. Um, the novel on the whole just really never grabbed me and, and caught my attention. Um, so really never where I got interesting outside, you know, as far as like the in-game story goes, like the real life stuff was really cool. I really did like it. It's just that over 15% of the story at most, it's not a lot. Um, so for me, the story fell a little flat. It gets a four score five out of 10, uh, for permanent online, a little bit of adventure book one. I plan to read book two. I'm hoping that it gets better. Um, but so far it's just like fell a little flat for me. So it gets a five out of 10. So there you go. 
Okay, on to our next one. It's going to be uh, Return to Dungeon, a Monster MC Lit RPG book, Cobalt Quest Book 1 by M.J. Kittelin Bruner. So there we go. Um, this one is 172 pages, $3.99. It is available in Kindle Unlimited. Uh, so first off, that price point is way too high, at least to me. I generally look for a price point of about um, a penny a page. Um, and this one is... Um, over double, almost triple of what I would normally pay. And that is, you know, that's a little bit high, but it is on Kindle Unlimited. So go check it out there. If you, if, if you think it's going to be interesting, uh, I'll read you the author's description of the story though. This down trying cobalt finds himself with one hell of a quest. Keck has spent his life being treated like a dog, but he's only dog like in appearance. You see, Kent's a cobalt who originally came from a dungeon and he spent most of his life enslaved to a gang of exiled mercenaries hiding out in a ju deadly jungle. When Kek gains the power to see the hidden mechanics of reality and learns to game them um, to expand his skills and find hidden meanings, he is soon entrusted with the noble quest. He must return to the dungeon where he came from and rescue his people from servitude to the dungeon lord. Faced with untold dangers, Kek is going to need allies, such as a sweet monk fairy and a, with the killer shriek, a deadly beautiful siren who fights best all natural and a central cat woman with lightning quick moves they're sure to they are sure going to keep this lone cobalt on his toes throughout his quest Keck will learn the hard way that one of the greatest opponents a hero confronts is his own self-doubt so there we go um i i'll be out on the honest i didn't like the story um from the cover art and from the novel description you think that this novel is going to be an interesting story told from the point of view of the Cobalt. Um, you might think you're going to see a world through the eyes of what most stories consider a monster and how that world is different for those monsters. Unfortunately, you'd be really disappointed, and I was. And I think part of this, part of the reason I didn't like the story is that the expectations for it are set too high. Like from the cover art, you think, oh, this is going to be a monster story. Yay. I mean, even on the title, it says a monster MC Little RPG. Uh, and I'll can see technically uh, the story first is LARPD. So I want to get that out of the way. There is a sub layer of a game mechanics that the main character, uh, Keck, eventually gets access to. Um, he's a rare individual. I'm going to explain why, because that's part of the story. Um, gets, to, gets to see things like stats, character sheets, HP bars, and more. He gets skills and gains levels according to those rules. So it is technically a little RPG. Um, however, the game mechanics of the story are very minimal. Um, they are there, even though there's no explanation of why they exist. Um, and part of that is that it's not really defined where there's going to be a, 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 a fantasy with RPG mechanics, or if this is some game where the characters are NPCs. Um, and with the exception of like one actual character sheet, you don't get any actual numbers. Um, you don't get any real details about how the mechanics work. Um, you get some vague references about like, oh, the, the cobalt sees that that monster he's fighting has a low strength score or a low STR. He doesn't actually know at first uh, or a super high dex, dex uh, dexterity. Um, but you don't actually get points of reference there uh, for most of the story to, to see what those things mean. Um, and when I'm, when I'm reading the story, I honestly get the impression that the author didn't want to get into the nitty gritty of the game stuff or to find like an actual game system. Um, and he kind of just knew that there were certain things that were expected in the Liberty story, like these, this game stuff talked about occasionally um, and harem stuff. in this I think the harem stuff was, is, is also inserted uh, wordly, but it is there. Um, honestly. And also the novel also needs a lot of, there's a lot of world, a uh, lack of world building the story. And again, I mentioned that before, like, you don't actually know if this is going to be a, uh, a VR world or uh, where everybody's NBC or a fantasy world, the hidden RPG mechanics. And I think fundamentally that lack of understanding makes the novel a little confusing because you don't have a, an idea of what those expectations are supposed to be for the novel, whether or not, um, I guess another thing that kind of bothered me was the fact that very often in the story, there are a lot of modern conventions that seem out of place and they seem out of place because in the world doesn't have a lot of world building. There's not a lot of uh, definition, like what to expect from your characters or world. Because if it's, again, if it's a VR world, then okay, having modern vernacular and modern comps that makes sense because there are players from our world there, right? But if it's a fantasy world uh, and it's usually set in like a medieval world, then a lot of modern concepts should not exist there. Um, things like, for example, even, even the entire game mechanic thing. If it's a fantasy, if it's medieval fantasy world, 
that just happens to be real RPG mechanics, then the characters probably shouldn't refer to them as gaming or like gaining powers specifically. Um, the main character, um, I'm gonna give you like a really con- uh, more concrete example of this. Um, early in the story, there's a, a, a druid. He discovers a way to make a potion so he can see behind uh, the game rules that rule the world, except that he specifically calls them game mechanics. And he wants, he's, he, he, he wants to game gamer powers. Um, and he starts, once he drinks the potion, he starts spreading off up against, uh, about all the game mechanics he, he sees and he now understands and he, he kind of automatically knows what a strength side is. He knows what charisma, he knows health points without actually um, exploring what they are or, or, or they're being in a kind of point where he's saying, oh, I don't know what these is. I have to figure them out. It's just, he automatically knows. So there's a lot of like foreknowledge there that he shouldn't have. And that kind of carries over into other characters. Um they start referencing things that they probably shouldn't know if this, if, if it is a fantasy RPG, like medieval fantasy world. Um, and again, part of that issue is that it's not really defined what kind of world it is. So, you know, those things seem out of place where they're referring to like philanthropy or redemption through philanthropy or like pop cultural references to make jokes. Like they feel a little bit out of place, at least for me, because again, that world building wasn't done, uh, so that you understand what what to expect from this world and the people that inhabit it. Um, and that, that's just one of the things. However, the biggest disappointment in the story is that promise. That pr- There's a promise from the cover and from specifically the title, A Monster MC Lit RPG, that this is going to be a story about a monster's perspective. And the main character is technically a cobalt. But the only reason you know that is because the other characters go out of their way to call him that. Um, there's literally, I mean, there's really nothing inherent in the writing or the main character's dialogue or his thinking or his cultural perspective that makes him feel like he's a monster, like he's he's something different. The way that the story is written, unfortunately, the main character feels like he's just a regular human. He might be a, a slave human or a poor human, um, but even in that respect, he's he's literate. He he's able to read. He's able to. Um, you know, to, to understand these concepts. Um, and, and it just, the main character feels like he's a human. And that's probably the biggest disappointment in the entire novel is that you're going to go in expecting this to be a monster story. Um, like the cobalt's going to be different. He's going to have a different cultural perspective. He might have a different mythology, different culture, whatever it is, uh, different speech patterns. And none of that exists. And that's kind of the biggest drawback of the story, the reason that I didn't like it the most. Like the actual action adventure stuff, not bad or horrible. Once you get into like the dungeon section, which is about halfway into the story, um, it's 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 fine. It's nothing to write home about, but it's not bad either. It, but the, like I said, the thing that kind of dro- dropped it into like, oh, this is not going to get its good score. I'm not having a good time at all. Like I'm actually having a bad time. Is that that promise of this being like a monster perspective? Like a, a it's just it falls flat, and it and just a big disappointment to me. Um, and it's also reflecting a lot of other reviews. If you look on Amazon as well, um, that's kind of it. Um, so for me, it gets a score of four out of ten. I did I actually did not like this story because again, I was expecting one thing, and I kind of got something else. And it is what it is. I just didn't have a good time. Um, Return to a dungeon, a monster, M- uh, monster MC, little bit D, Cobalt Quest Book One gets a score of four to ten. And like I said, there. Just as a side note, there are other stories that do the monster class thing better. Um, Life reset. Um, a Goblin's Tale, which is not Liberty, but it still tells the story of a go- from the Goblin's point of view. Um, everybody loved Lost Chest. Um, Re-Monster, or like any of the re-tag stuff, which indicates like reincarnation. Um, you can look them up online. A lot of other stories that do this kind of concept a, a whole lot better. This one was just disappointing. So there you go. Okay, on to our next review. Um, a Fistful of Sand, a book of Karelia Samsung Book 1 by A.J. Galen. Okay, this one is 358 pages, $4.99. It is also available on Kindle Limited. I'll read you the author's description. I really, really hate falling. Falling is stupid. Gravity is stupid. Orcs are stupid. Maybe if the voice hadn't dumped Sam's strength, she wouldn't have ended up chained to a post, waiting to be two orcs lunch. Maybe if the voice hadn't dumped charisma, she could have talked her way out. Maybe if the voice had maxed dexterity completely, she could have escaped without hurting herself. At least, as a halfling, Sam was able to hide easily. Sam wasn't sure how big people managed in life. They could fit into half the. They couldn't fit into half the places they wanted. Not that Sam was where she wanted. The desert where she grew, 
where she'd grown up, no longer welcomed her, and she made her way to the city state of Triport. She'd never seen a city before. Once there, she uncovers the danger lurking in the ancient ruins beneath the city, and it will take all of Sam's wisdom, skills, and pint-sized audacity to save Triport from other utter ruin. So there you go, halfling tale. Who did think it's a better story? Um, better title, I should say. Okay, um, getting to the nitty gritty of the story. Um, I have several issues with this particular novel that stopped me from actually enjoying it. Um, the actual storytelling, the it is very slice of life, um, but most of the issues using about the things that stopped me from actually having a, a, a decent time with it. The story itself, like it's not badly written, it's not going to get a, a, a negative review, um, but um, there's just things um, with the game mechanics, with the way that the game mechanics are treated in the story. You know, kind of the things that I really love about Liberty. Um, the way they were done just stopped me from enjoying the story entirely. Um, and if you can look past that stuff, you might actually like a, find a really enjoyable story. Uh, if you like a stronger female character, um, if you like banter, this is you might like this a lot more um, than I did. Um, the game mechanics are probably the biggest thing that put me off. Um, one... They they appear most of the game mechanics appear in the first ten percent of the story. There's definitions of stats, skills, main character, um, has a voice in her head that explains everything game mechanic wise. So it it is liberty. Um, but from the very beginning of the novel, novel, you can tell that the author is more than willing to fudge the numbers in the game world, and that bugged me a lot. Um, there are several fight scenes uh, with the main character as described in the, in the, on the novel description, where she's fighting a couple orcs who I, reca- who I have recaptured. Um, yet, despite the creatures being described in the novel as being able to one-shot her, um, she only takes one point of damage from each punch and stab, which seems a little weird, uh, especially considering that the game mechanics seem to be based on the um, D&D rules, um, like 3.5 edition. So that one point of damage from each point of time really doesn't make sense, especially considered uh, that these are orcs that are much bigger. They have a much better strength score, whatever the case is. Um, at one point, uh, the main character is actually punched and stabbed, uh, and yet she only takes one point of damage total. And the main character wins the fight by one-shotting uh, each character. She stabs them in a special place, like the kidneys or like the back of their head or whatever. Um, and she basically kills them that way. Um, despite... Being her her character sheet being shown and, and showing showing as a strength score of six, which um, in the new terms is like a very low below average score, and that's acknowledged in the story as well. Uh, and she survives with just one hit point left, and which explains why earlier in that particular section, that particular scene, uh, why even though she was punched and stabbed, she only took one damage because if she had taken like two damage, she would be dead. Um, and that just reflects the fact that the author is more than happy to fudge the numbers a little bit um, in service to the story. Um, And that it kind of sets the tone for the most of the story, at least for me, Um, that the author is more than okay with like not really taking the game mechanics serious or or making them an important part of the story. Um, After the 10% mark of the novel, when the main character gets into the new city um, triport, um, most of the notifications and other established game mechanics become much rarer. Uh, the, the story is written more as if it is a, a more traditional fantasy story. Um, and some people are going to like that, and some people aren't. I, I did not, because, I, again, I expect more of a, um RPG feel for this. And I'm not saying that there aren't in the story. Like, the RPG mechanics that are in the story, when they're spoken or, 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 or described or used, are used accurately. They're used um, appropriately. Um, but they don't feel like they really matter to the story. And I'll explain in a second why. Um, I'll explain now, actually. Um, uh, the, the biggest reason for the fact that um, when the game mechanics are shown after that temporary mark, when they are even talked about by the voice in the main character's head, um, there is no acknowledgement of those things. So, like, the main character, for example, the main character will be running away from somebody. She'll jump really high into a building, whatever. And she'll, there'll be a little notification in the, in the description on the, on the novel saying, Oh, um, skill gained jumping. Right. But then the story just continues on as if that notification never existed. Or like the, the, the voice in her head will say something about, Oh, this, you know, describing this particular skill or like some, some little bit of game banter. Um, but the story basically ignores it. And the main character ignores the fact that that occurred. And that to, that lack of acknowledgement really did make me feel like um, those game mechanics don't don't matter. Um, 
you know, even when the main character is hurt and there's a damage notification, uh, you think that she would care that it would say negative one or negative three or whatever the case is. But in, instead, the story is written such that that the main character doesn't know it exists in a way. And I think, and this is just hypothetical from my point of view, that a lot of the story was written in advance as like a fantasy story. Um, with, I'm not saying the, the, this was changed in maybe form. I believe the author intended this for be a, a little bit story from the very beginning. The game mechanics are just too integral and the, the jokes are too integral or too, too, too well done and too thorough, I guess you'd say. But it feels like a lot of the story was written as a fantasy story. And then the game mechanics were kind of inserted in post, like, and, and, it, and if you read the story, you can kind of see that might be the case because the story goes on. It's like a description of what occurs and then like game notification, but it's kind of ignored because the story just continues on as if that thing never occurred. And that to me just kind of bugged me through the entire story. And it just kind of says to me when I'm reading this that, oh, the game stuff doesn't matter here. Like even though it's there and it's throughout the entire novel, like fundamentally um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter at all like uh, if if the, the numbers don't, don't make sense it's okay the author will change them so they make sense so the main character never dies or has any real threat to them um and that just kind of bugged me and that stopped me from really enjoying the story for the most part um talking about the story itself um like i said it's not a badly written story in any way shape or form um it's just that it's mostly slice of life, the main character going on adventures with, this is a later reveal that there's a gamer in her head who's, who's telling her things. Um, but it's not really made clear whether or not like this, if this entire world is a game, um, and the main character is an NPC, or if like the main character is a gamer who's just tapping into like this alternate dimension or something. Uh, and so there's also what, there's also a, like a different level of expectation depending on which kind of point of view you see. Um, there's definitely good world building here. Like the world, the world feels full and there's plenty of like um, description of like scenery and background characters and, and, and mythology and all the good stuff. That's, that's all really well done. But for me, the, the thing that just stopped me from having a good time with it is the fact that the game stuff felt inserted. Uh, and, and it was just so ignored by the main character, um, that it felt like the game stuff wasn't important to the story. And that's kind of the core of what I enjoy about it is that the game stuff matters. The game stuff is almost its own character and that it matters so much to the world. And it's, it, it's as important as gravity is. And at that core, I don't feel like that's the case here in the story. And maybe that's just me and that's fine. Um, if you can ignore those things, if the number, if, if, if numbers making sense in a story in a literary story don't matter to you you're probably gonna have a better time with this than i it's just that my brain for whatever reason can't ignore that uh and whether that's good or bad it's just it stopped me from enjoying this story and it is what it is um for me though um it gets a score of five out of ten it's not bad it just wasn't good for me at least um so that's a fistful of sand book of corelia sam's song book one with a score of five out of ten i just don't have a good time with it there you go Okay, on to our last review, um, Inside Out by Ellis Michaels. Okay, uh, this one is 187 pages, $3.99, available on Kindle Unlimited. I'll read you the author's description. It's just another day in Boston for Mitch, Luke, Alyssa, and Stephanie. They're four college-age friends who like to play the popular online game Blood Fe Feast MMO together. But when they log into the game, none of their characters are where they last saved them, or, and Mitch's character has two new items, a mysterious orb and a scroll. Before the friends can figure out why, they're blinded by a bright flash of light. When their vision finally returns, they're shocked to find that they're now inside the game in their characters' bodies. But the friends are even more surprised when they learn that their characters has somehow left the game out now in their bodies back in Boston. Trapped in the fantastic world of Blood Feast, the friends embark on a quest to try and get back to reality. In this world full of magic, shifters, and monsters, they face one challenge after another uh, as they look for a way home. Meanwhile, the Blood Feast characters try to find their way around modern-day Boston. With no magic or shifting abilities, the characters have a hard time adjusting to 21st century America. Another uh, author has a... Um, uh, a warning at the bottom of the thing. Uh, this book contains extreme violence, sexual situations, bad language, worse language, vandalism, drinking, blood, gore, gore, and blood, um, six of the seven Niven sins, and a bunch of other like jokey warning labels. Um, 
Now, uh, first to address, this is overpriced. At, at 187 pages for $399, yeah, I wouldn't purchase this. Um, it is a decent Kindle Unlimited. And I'd say I, I, I enjoyed this as a, and I would recommend it as a Kindle Unlimited read only. If you have that program, go grab it. Otherwise, it's too, it's way too expensive for what it is. Um, the, the novel basically takes the concept of Freaky Friday and applies it to an MMO. There's body swapping between like four friends who play a game and unexp- and, 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 and four MMO characters who are suddenly self-aware. Um, it's never explained why they become self-aware. Um, they just are, and they use in-game magic to swap bodies with the character. Like the premise is honestly a little thin and weak, but you know, the Freaky Friday concept has always been that way. Um, there are basically two stories here. One, uh, the four um, player characters, the people from our world, um, looking for a way to get back to the real world. They kill monsters, they go on adventures, they talk to wacky NPCs, there's bantering, there's humor. Um, it's a decent part of the story. It's not amazing, it, but it's decent. It's it's entertaining enough for me, at least. The action isn't great, but there's a lot of humor here. There's a lot of like jokes and puns, um, insider jokes, gamer jokes, all kinds of stuff like that, um, and some silly stuff. And the humor is either going to land with you or isn't. If you if you get the jokes and you enjoy them, you, we're probably going to enjoy the novel on the whole. If you don't like the humor, though, you, this is not going to be good for you. Um, it's, there's a lot of that in this particular in the particular story. Um, I I feel like this particular aspect of the story could have been done a little bit better, and that it could have been tightened up a little bit because there's a lot of wandering and there's a lot of like I feel like wasted time for these characters um, that could have been better focus i should say so it's not bad or anything it's just like okay had it been tighter had it been more focused more streamlined i probably would enjoy a little bit more because it would have it would have felt a little more focused now the second part of the story um is is the the game characters the ones that are transported into the world into their players bodies which is a weird way to describe it um those characters are in the modern world they wake up in their respective apartments and now they have to deal with this um cultural shift this this new perspective in the into a modern world um it's very much like an immigrant story or like a stranger in a strange land kind of stuff and that to me was as interesting if not more so than the game stuff to be honest um it's unfortunately a relatively small portion of the novel um where these characters have to deal with like things like cell phones modern toiletry uh restrooms and bathrooms and there's a lot of that kind of like jokey humor there like oh People from um, medieval society suddenly being in the world in like the 21st century, the 22nd century, whatever, and having to deal with all those like great cultural shifts. Um, and it is unfortunate that this isn't explored and expanded a little more because it, I think it could have been like a really good part of the story had it been more developed. Um, unfortunately, the four brave adventurers who are used to killing monsters and, and demons and stuff in like their fantasy world don't have the bravery to leave their apartments or at least like each other's apartments. Like they're basically two apartments here that that are the focus of the story and the characters go between them two. And that's kind of it. Like they don't explore the greater Boston area. They don't talk to a lot of people. Um, and so I think there was a lot of missed opportunities for like these exploration of the different social structures or the way that they, there was a um, cultural shifts or a lot, just like a lot of jokes. Oh, there's a lot of missed opportunities for that kind of humor. But because of what's there is entertaining, at least. Um, overall, this is a decently entertaining story. It's not amazing. It isn't. Um, but for me, at least, because the humor landed, it was funny. And it, 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 I, I had a, a decently enough time with it. Um, and again, but if the humor doesn't land with you, but the jokes don't land with you, we're probably not going to like it because some of the characters are also jerks. Um, the world characters who go to the game world. Um, and that also might bother some people. Um, also, I, I forgot to note this. Um, there are references to marijuana in the novel, and for some reason that bothered some reviewers, but there is no actual drug use in the story, which I don't know if that matters to them or not, but it is what it is. Um, but for me, the story worked well enough. Um, I had a, a decent amount of time with it. Like I said, I wouldn't purchase this novel. It's just too expensive for what it is. But as a Kindle Unlimited read, yeah, I had a good time with it. Seven out of 10. Um, as a Kindle Unlimited read specifically, though. Um, so that's Inside Out, Blood Feast, book one, with a score of seven out of 10. There you go. That's it. We're done. Finished. Um, thank you very much for listening and for watching, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks for a little <laughs> hanging out with me as I uh, talk about this, this genre that I love, Blood RPG. Um, if you want to follow us or help support us, um, 
just go follow us on Facebook. That's honestly one of the easiest ways to do it. Um, it helps boost our presence. It helps uh, get the news out about the show. Uh, so it's liking on, on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube uh, is great. You can also support us on Patreon directly. Get some nice rewards um, if you're a supporter that way. Um, but but if you like the podcast, there are tons of ways to help support us. You can find out all the ways you do so at litrpgpodcast.com forward slash support. So there you go. Thanks again for hanging out with me. And until we can hang out again, ladies and gentlemen, um, remember to go read some Litter BG. Goodbye, everybody.